And so we left off in Leviticus chapter 14, um, ending in verse 10. So we'll pick up there. And just a brief recap, we spoke about um, the cleansing of leprosy, the Levitical rules of how to cleanse leprosy, and leprosy being a type of sin. Um, Leprosy, known current day as something called Hansen's disease, um, the way it was to be dealt with was it first was to be examined by the priest, um, and then it was to be uh, then assessed as to um, uh, whether it was definitely something that was ne- needed to be dealt with and, and how it was to be dealt with. Interesting that that priest, um, in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 and 15, it says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. And so this priest, this high priest that's taking a look at sin and assessing whether the sin is, um, you know, how bad it is, it's not somebody who can't understand what sin is all about. And when we think about Jesus having come and being fully God and fully man at the same time, he walked around in the sandals of a man and he was able to see all those things and deal with all those things. Um, There isn't one thing we can think of and say, well, you know, I don't know, you know, God God can't, can't understand what I'm going through. And I'm sure Jesus felt many things that we may not even understand but it says that he can sympathize with our weaknesses. And so he, he gets us. He knows what we're going through and we're going through things. And keeping on that same, that same idea that the dealing with leprosy is, kind of, is a, akin to dealing with sin and cleansing of sin, we'll continue um, on that vein. And um, speaking about the, uh, the elements that were involved, we'll see those elements again. We covered that last time, talking about the elements that were required by the the priests to to cleanse this leprosy. We have the the cedar wood, which is a representation of the cross. Um, Cedar wood is um, something that's uh, impervious to insects and um, and decay. And it's something that, um, a, a type of wood that um, is known for its longevity and durability. Um, it has naturally occurring oils um, known as polyphenols, which, um, which allow it to have this type of, uh, this type of uh, um, just strength and, and durability. Um, there are some that even feel that um, that the wood that may have been used for the crosses that were used in the time of Jesus may have even been made out of cedar. I remember cedar is something that was used um, in First Kings chapters five and six. The cedars of Lebanon were 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 used to build the temple. The scarlet, the representation of the blood that would be necessary. Um, to be shed by the sacrifice. Remember, we talked about the worm, the, that Caucasus elysis worm, which um, was crushed for its red color. And hyssop. Hyssop was a plant, is a plant, that is um, pretty well renowned for having some uh, medicinal purposes. Uh, it reduces inflammation, calms the nervous system, improves circulation, and also has polyphenols or oils that um, help expand the blood vessels and allow them to carry more oxygen through the body. So it doesn't, doesn't surprise me that the hyssop was used when Jesus was in agony and was going through what he was going through to, to you know, administer the, the sour wine. You know, there may have been a thought that there was something, maybe the hyssop may have, you know, may have helped Jesus in his time of agony. 
And so, again, those elements, we'll see these again as we get into the chapter. So we'll pick up here in verse 10. It says, On the eighth day he shall take two male lambs without blemish, one ewe lamb of the first year without blemish, three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering, and one log of oil. So here is the continuation of the, the cleansing of the person who has gone through the cleansing from the priest, having had the leprosy cleansed. Now this is the continuation. Now there's three lambs involved there. Um, we see that, uh, what they call an expositional constancy of the numbers three continuing to be used. And so here's these three lambs. And um, interesting terminology of a log of oil. Apparently a log of oil is three-fifths of a pint of oil, which amounts to somewhere between nine or ten ounces. So it was, you know, a, a pretty good-sized cup of, of, of oil to be used for this. Verse 11, Then the priest who makes him clean shall present the man who is to be made clean and those things before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. So the priest can now present this person who's been cleansed, um, having been cleansed of their sin before the Lord. Now, when we are in a state of sin, and, and you have to bear in mind that this is uh, in the context of the old covenant, where you just didn't go into the tabernacle. You couldn't just go into the church. You had to go in. There was a specific reason why you needed to go in. And you, in essence, had to have the, the invitation of the priest to be able to go in. And in this case, this would be the, the, uh, the case with the, the person who's being cleansed, um, having set this up with the priest to go in. But um, the point here is for them to be able to be presented before the Lord. Now, in the state of sin, we can't really go before the Lord. But when the priest, our high priest being Jesus, having cleansed us, we can go before the Lord and we can be blameless. And these lambs that are mentioned here, it says without blemish. Now, we can go before the Lord just as these lambs, without blemish, being presented before the Lord after having been cleansed by this priest. He goes on here in verse 12, And the priest shall take one male lamb and offer it as a trespass offering and the log of oil, and wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. Then he shall kill the lamb in the place where he kills the sin offering and the burnt offering in a holy place, for as the sin offering is the priest's, so is the trespass offering. It is most holy. So a sin offering, now the sin offering and the trespass offering are slightly different. Um, a sin offering is to atone for the sin, the sin nature inherent in every man. The trespass offering to atone for the specific sins committed by by an individual, by, by a man. And so it sounds like some redundancy that, okay, well, the sin offering, the trespass offering, um, there's also the burnt offering, which we'll get into a little later. But the idea there is that there's a, there's a certain way that the Levitical rules say that it should be done, and there's a reason when you go before the Lord, this um, sin offering is to deal with the, the inherent nature of sin, kind of a, a larger scope. The trespass offering is to atone for the specific sins committed by, by that individual. Now we're speaking of this individual who's been cleansed of their sin or been cleansed of their leprosy. And so as we continue on, it says, verse 14, the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering. Now remember, that's the, the, the specific sin of the individual. She'll take the blood of the trespass offering, and the priest shall put it on the tip of the right ear of him who is being cleansed, or to be cleansed, 
on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. And the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it into the palm of his own left hand. Then the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left hand and shall sprinkle some of the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. So some interesting, very specific um, things that have to be done. The utilization of the, uh, of the oil now comes into place. Um, the sin had to be dealt with first by the atonement, the, the blood sacrifice. And then the oil, which is always a type of the, of the Holy Spirit, can then become part of this ritual as well. Something to keep in mind, um, in order for the Holy Spirit to come and be part of what's happening in, in, in our cleansing, which is something that happens um, on an ongoing basis. I think it was spoken of very recently, the, the process of us going before the Lord and asking for forgiveness. It's a constant process. We don't just do it once and it's, and it's over. And the reason for that is because we have a sin nature and our sin nature just doesn't disappear. We're still in these bodies of flesh and we still deal with things. And the Lord sees that, but he gives us a way for us to say, okay, I'm going to claim the blood of Jesus Christ and put my faith in that in order that I can be cleansed and come before the Lord again. And so this instance here where the, the oil comes into play is once that blood sacrifice has been made, now the usage of the oil. And the specific placement of this oil is interesting as well. Verse 14 again, it says, The priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering, and the priest shall put it on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, on the thumb of the right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. Now, I, spoiler alert, um, I, <laughs> I jumped ahead a little bit because the oil hasn't come into play yet, but it will. But the placement of the blood... So the placement of the blood on the right ear is to atone for the things that we hear, the things that we take in, the things that get inside of our, of our head, so to speak, and the things that happen by way of, of that uh, physical attribute of our, of our bodies. The blood on the right thumb is significant of the things that we, we do or have done. You know, when you do something, it's, especially in that society, it was done with your hands. You, you plowed your fields, you, you built your homes, you, you, you did the things that you would do with your hands. And to a certain degree, we still do. And then on the big toe of the foot, it was to deal with the things, or I should say the places that we've been the places we've gone. And remember, 90% of all travel was done by, by foot. You walked everywhere. You know, I don't think Jesus ever went anywhere without, I mean, he walked, unless they were on the water and they were in a boat. I mean, you, that's, that was the mode of travel in that day. And so these things are significant. And the application of the blood to cover all of those areas now this is a uh, kind of a same symbolic way of touching on those areas, um, those human areas that were um, dealing with the things that you would hear or the things that you would take in, um, the things that you would do or the places you've been. And then he brings in, he says, then the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in the left hand shall sprinkle some of the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. That number seven is always a number of completion. 
This is a way of saying, okay, this is, the, this is completing this process. We're going to sprinkle this oil before the Lord and, you know, in, in the presence of this person who has, has now been kind of um, these areas of his, of his, his uh, physical body have been kind of targeted with the blood. And now the oil comes into play. And the oil goes before the Lord. It's sprinkled before the Lord. Verse 17, And the rest of the oil in his hand, the priest shall put some on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, on the blood of the trespass offering. So then the oil comes in to, in essence, come just after the blood. And they're to be used in conjunction to signify that, okay, the, the blood sacrifice has happened, the atonement, the covering has happened, and now here comes the oil. And we know that the oil, like I said before, a type of the Holy Spirit coming in to be used to, in essence, be applied and be used in a way to, um, to help this person as they continue to, to be cleansed and to walk and, and hopefully to be walking according to God's precepts and, and how God would want them to continue on after having been cleansed from this leprosy. But we have to be cleansed or covered by the blood first, emptied of our sin before the Holy Spirit can begin to do the work. There's a word um, that's used um, for a helper, it's parakletos, which means an advocate. And you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to be turning to a couple places in John chapter 14, the Gospel of John chapter 14, starting in verse 16, it says, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. That word there, parakletos, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and will be with you. So when we're cleansed from our sin, he comes and he dwells with us. We know that when we come to that point where we know that we need to be cleansed, and we touched on this last week, that um, that we receive that blood sacrifice. That blood sacrifice becomes something that we claim, and then we go forward. And as we go forward, the Holy Spirit comes to be our helper, that parakletos, the advocate for us, to help us as we continue on. And he continues here in verse 18, the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand, he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed, so the priest shall make atonement for him before the Lord. There have been several instances where the, the oil is used in the specific usage of the oil on the head, on someone's head, is, is known as an anointing. And it's interesting that the... In the scripture, there's four different kinds of people who were anointed with oil upon the head. There were kings, prophets, priests, and lepers. In this context, looking at the lepers as sinners, that means all of us. And the Lord is, is willing to allow that anointing to be upon Literally anyone. Because if it's going from 
kings and prophets, and we know that David, when David was anointed king, you know that, uh, that the prophet Samuel anointed him with oil, and that was a ceremonial pouring of the oil on the head. Um, and this was a signi- signifying of the Lord blessing. And it's interesting that something or someone as lowly as a leper would be treated the same as kings and prophets and priests. And it tells me that the Lord sees us all equal. And we're all able to partake of that blessing, that anointing. And so he continues on here. Verse 19, Then the priest shall offer the sin offering and make atonement for him who is to be cleansed from his uncleanness. Afterward he shall kill the burnt offering. And the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar, so the priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be clean. And so this is kind of the rounding out of the whole process of making him clean. And there's a series of offerings to be offered up. And looking at this, where it says, he shall be made clean, it reminds me of being made whole. It's a way of being made whole. And there's a great account, again, in the Gospel of John. John was popular today. Starting in uh, John chapter 5, starting in verse 2. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. Now Bethesda in Hebrew actually means house of mercy or flowing water. So Bethesda having five porches, verse 3, in these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he had already had, had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, Do you want to be made well? And I stop there for just a minute. If anyone really understands the significance of, of Jesus asking, do you want to be made well or do you want to be made whole? And if you can really grasp that, how could you say no? How could you possibly say, no, I don't want to be free of my sin? And sadly, there are people who know that Jesus can free them and Jesus can make them whole. But they're so caught up in their sin that they don't, they don't want to go there. And it's a sad thing. But for this man, he said, says, verse 7, The sick man answered him, Sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, Rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked, and that day was the Sabbath. Maybe this guy was a leper. Maybe this guy was dealing with leprosy for so long that it had killed the nerve endings in his feet. Um, and he had had amputations. It doesn't really say what this guy had, but it was something that he had had for 38 years. It's a pretty long time. And how sad it is to know what can heal you, but not having the ability to get there. And I love this illustration because Jesus just says, you believe it? Done. Done. 
It's not by anything that you can do. It's by what Jesus can do. And so Jesus said, you're good. It's all, it's all good. You're done. Healed. And of course, it being on the Sabbath, that created some problems for Jesus later on. But getting back to Leviticus, we see this process of being healed. And that it was the priest who went through all of these steps and all of these things to allow this person to be healed. Verse 21, but he, if he is poor and cannot afford it, then he shall take one male lamb as a trespass offering to be waived to make atonement for him, one-tenth of an ephah of, flour, of fine flour mixed with oil as a grain offering, a log of oil, and two turtle doves or two young pigeons, such as he is able to afford. One shall be a sin offering and the other a burnt offering. He shall bring them to the priest on the eighth day for his cleansing to the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. So he makes provision here for the poor. Just like this man at the, the pool of Bethesda, he didn't have the means. He couldn't do it. Jesus stepped in and just said, it's okay. Don't worry about doing it. Don't worry about what you can do. It's about what I'm going to do. And here again, verse 21, for the poor, one lamb is sufficient. Before we come to the Lord, we're all poor in spirit. Matthew 5, 3 says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So if we are poor in spirit and we see that and we understand that and come to that realization that we need a cleansing, that we have sin that's like leprosy that's eating away at us, that's killing us slowly, that's something that's, it's a disease that we can't heal ourselves of. It's a beautiful picture here that this one lamb this one offering of a lamb is sufficient. And of course, as the priest continues on and speaks of these other things, these are things that are somewhat inconsequential. Someone that's poor could definitely afford to bring these things. Verse 23, he says, He shall bring them to the priest on the eighth day for his cleansing to the door of the tabernacle of meeting before the Lord. Again, having the atonement Provided by one lamb, he's able to go before the Lord. And on the eighth day, you know, number eight, um, not to get too caught up in numerology, but you know, some of these things are significant. And you know, the, the number of eight always speaks of new beginnings. And when we go through the process of, of realizing that we're sinners in need of a Savior, you know, we, we begin again. Um, the whole term that we're all familiar with, being born again, it's, it's, it's a real thing. You know, lives changed, and it's one thing that the, you know, the world can argue um, all the philosophical, theological angles, but they can't argue with somebody who's had their life completely, radically changed. And I've seen it, I'm sure some of you have seen it as well, where someone who you think was just one foot in the grave, long gone, you know, on the highway to hell, so to speak, and you hear that they got saved, and you go, really? Are we talking about the same person? It's like, yeah, God can do that. That poorness of spirit, once it's realized, God allows a way for them to come to him and be presented before him, before the Lord, as it says here at the end of verse 23. In verse 24, And the priest shall take the lamb of the trespass offering and the log of oil, and the priest shall wave them as a wave offering before the Lord. So 
So we see that the atonement can be made through the blood of this lamb. Verse 25, then he shall kill the lamb of the trespass offering, and the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering and put it on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. And the priest shall pour some of the oil into the palm of his own left hand. Then the priest shall sprinkle with his right finger some of the oil that is in his left hand seven times before the Lord. Just like we had just covered it's a, a similar process. And you see that that oil, again being in, used in conjunction with the blood to help us to deal with, on the ear, dealing with the things that we've heard. Now, the word used here in Hebrew is a word, akuo, which is to listen or to comprehend by hearing. In essence, it's what we take in or to what we understand. It's the things that we basically go into that computer that's in our head. And, you know, it's what we are exposed to, what we carry with us. You know, the things we've heard, the things we've experienced. And then again, the thumb the things we've done or the things that we will do. The things or places we've been to or will go to future. Again, speaking of the blood on the, on the big toe, in the blood and the, the oil being used in conjunction again. And looking at this from the perspective of at that point when there's a realization that a cleansing needs to happen, the cleansing happens, but the application of the, the oil also signifies that the Lord knows that this isn't the end of this. It's going to continue. But as Romans 5.8 says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us that, in wh that while we were still or yet sinners, Christ died for us. It's an ongoing thing, and he knows that. He knows that we're not perfect when we realize that we're not perfect. He knows that we're going to continue in imperfection, striving for something better, but knowing that we're going to... I think the very nature of, of striving implies that it's not, you know, floating on. It's not, you know, cruising downhill. It's striving is striving. If you've ever gone and walked or gone on a hike and gone somewhere where you're going uphill, it's, it's striving. <laughs> Trust me. Um, I went on a hike recently, and um, there was a lot more uphill than I had anticipated, and it was pretty rough. It was striving. But it made me think of that okay, I can see that there's a top of this hill. Hopefully, it's better on the other side of that hill. But it's a struggle. And he knows that we're going to struggle, and he knows that we're going to fail. And he knows we're going to have good days, and we're, we're going to have bad days. But as he continues speaking of the, the application of the atonement, And the implementation of the oil. Verse 27, Then the priest shall sprinkle with his right hand some of the oil that is in his left hand seven times before the Lord. Again, the number of completeness, completing the process. Verse 28, And the priest shall put some of the oil that is in his hand on the tip of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, on the thumb of the right hand and on the big toe of his right foot, on the place of the blood of the trespass offering. The rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand, he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed to make atonement for him before the Lord. And he shall offer one of the turtle doves or young pigeons such as he can afford, such as he is able to afford, the one as a sin offering and the other as a burnt offering. With the grain offering, so the priest shall make atonement for him 
who is to be cleansed before the Lord. This is the law for one who had a leper sore who cannot afford the usual cleansing. And so he continues uh, to go through the same process of how they're supposed to be cleansed in the symbolic way that it's supposed to be done. And then here in verse 33, he kind of shifts gears a little bit and speaks to the leprous plague, not just being something that can harm an individual, but can also harm a dwelling place or a home. Verse 33, And the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When you have come into the land of Canaan, which I give you as a possession, and I put the leprous plague in a house in the, in the land of your possession, and he who owns the house comes and tells the priest, saying, It seems to me that there is some plague in the house. So now we're speaking of a plague in the house. Again, a representation of sin, the leprosy. Um, It can also be a a source of corruption in a house, a dwelling place. Um, For practicality's sake, this could be the presence of some sort of a mold or some sort of a bacterial growth. Remember in those days, most of the homes were were built um, with stone, There were some timber involved, but they would use plaster to plaster over the stones. And and if you've ever seen how mold can can grow on just about anything, and given the right conditions, it can really be a health hazard. Now, from a spiritual sense, it being some sort of infection, some sort of a sin, that's actually attached to some sort of a, of a dwelling place. Now, we are all potential dwelling places of the Lord. You know, our soul, our being, we walk around, if we're saved, we'll walk around with the Lord dwelling within us. So it can be applied in that sense as well. But remember that When they went into the land, they went into a land, the land of Canaan, where there were pagan religions and they were basically worshiping demonic idols. And they were um, involved in a lot of things that were not good. And the the demonic realm is, is, is real. You know, Ephesians 6 speaks of, you know, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against, you know, principalities and rulers of darkness and, and you know, demonic entities. And as they go into this place, there's some sort of contamination of a house. It could be physical, but it could very well be a spiritual thing. And so keeping in mind that they went into a land where they were told... You're going to go into a land that's going to be, you know, you're going to walk into cities that are already built. There's going to be vineyards already planted. There's going to be crops already there. It's all going to be, you're not going to really have to do much, but go in and occupy. And so going in and moving into a house that has some sort of contamination, so to speak, was probably a very real thing. Verse 35, and he who owns the house comes and tells the priest, saying, it seems to me that there is some plague in the house. Then the priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest goes into it to look at the plague, that all that is in the house may not be made unclean, and afterward the priest shall go in to look at the house. So again, a process of the priest examining the extent of this plague's infestation and properly you know, designating a time of seven days for the priest to make this determination. Verse 38, Then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shut up the house seven days. And the priest shall come again on the seventh day and look. And indeed, if the plague has spread on the walls of the house, then the priest shall command that they take away the stones in which is the plague and they shall cast them into an unclean place outside the city. So there's a a picture here of 
Maybe not the whole house being contaminated, but maybe just part of it. How do you deal with that? And it tells us here that maybe they have to take away some of the stones. Maybe they have to, we've, we've seen that here recently in you know, our current day. You know, there's sometimes people go in to do a renovation in a house and you know, back in probably 80 to 100 years ago, uh, someone discovered this wonderful substance called asbestos because it was, it was a great product for what was necessary at the time. Well, given a few years and some, you know, some experiences of people getting ill, we find out that asbestos isn't such a wonderful product and that it's actually very harmful. And asbestos abatement, getting rid of that, is something that has to be taken very seriously and done with great care. And the implication here is that when there's something like this that can be harmful, it says that you shall take these stones, um, take away the stones in which is the plague, and they shall cast them into an unclean place outside the city. Set apart, take it away. You know, that word consecration is always implied to separate, separate away from something that is potentially harmful. And again, consecration, taking the, con the, the contaminated and taking it away, getting rid of it. He continues, and he shall cause the house to be scraped inside all around, and the dust that they scrape off they shall pour out in an unclean place outside the city. Then they shall take other stones and put them in the place of those stones, and he shall take other mortar and plaster the house. Sounds pretty straightforward. How to deal with this? And when we look at this in the context of spiritual contamination, the dwelling place, um, there's a, a word in Hebrew called, uh, it's a word that's bayit, which is transliterated as beth, which means house of. Now that word beth, of course we've heard one of the most famous beths is Bethlehem, but beth is house of. You'll notice if you look at the names of synagogues, um, that name beth is usually somewhere in the name. But that name, Beth, can also, Bayit or Beth can also be applied to um, a place being a, a city or a country, um, even an institution. But definitely a home or a house, a family, um, something that God has ordained and set apart that has been contaminated. And so the way to deal with it is to take it apart. Take it apart and take the bad part out of it. I think of the, that word of consecration of taking the clean from the unclean and taken to its proper place. And if it's corrupt and the corruption has spread, it's to be dismantled with care. In Matthew 12, 25, it says, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself will not stand. Now, from a spiritual standpoint, you look at that, and you think, okay, well, if something's corrupt, it has to be taken apart. It has to be cleansed. It has to be dealt with. And if it's completely corrupt, how is it going to stand? There's a famous speech that was given by... Um, some unknown guy by the name of Abraham Lincoln um, in 1858. He gave a speech speaking of the country at that time being divided. It was actually a speech that he gave before the Illinois State uh, Convention and he, when he was accepting the uh, senatorial nomination to, be a, to run for senator. So this is prior to his presidential aspiration days And a few years before the Civil War actually started, he could see the division. It was already starting to affect the country. 
And if you see that if from a spiritual sense, a house divided against itself cannot stand. You know, look at the implication from the context of a family or even a church. If the church is divided and there's division, how is that place going to stand? And so he continues on here, and we'll hopefully wrap this up quickly. Um, And if the plague comes back and breaks out in the house after he has taken away the stones, after he has scraped the house, and after it is plastered, then the priest shall come and look, and indeed, if if the plague is spread in the house, it is an act of leprosy in the house. It is unclean. And he shall break down the house, its stones, its timber, and all the plaster of the house, and he shall carry them outside the city to an unclean place. Moreover, he who goes into the house at all while it is shut up shall be unclean until evening, and he who lies down in the house shall wash his clothes, and he who eats in the house shall wash his clothes. And so knowing that a place is possibly corrupted, going in and making yourself comfortable in this place, knowing that it's corrupted, you're going to be corrupted. And you're going to be ceremonially unclean and have to, have to uh, you know, quarantine for 24 hours and, and wash and make sure that you're, you're not taking that corruption with you once you leave that corrupted place. So he continues here, verse 48, but if the priest comes in and looks at it, and indeed the plague is not spread in the house after the house was plastered, then the priest shall pronounce the house clean because the plague is healed. Now, interesting that word um, um, plastered. It's a covering. It's a covering over. The actual translation of it is atonement. It's reconciling it. It's till you took the bad out, And now you're covering over it. And so he continues here. Verse uh, 49. And he shall take to cleanse the house. And this may be a familiar scenario here. Two birds, cedar wood, scarlet, and hyssop. Then he shall kill one of the birds in an earthen vessel over running water. And he shall take the cedar wood the hyssop, the scarlet, and the living bird, and dip them in the blood of the slain bird and in the running water, and sprinkle the house seven times. And he shall cleanse the house with the blood of the bird and the running water and the living bird with the cedar wood, the hyssop, and the scarlet. So that's mentioning those elements three times. And he shall cleanse the house with the blood of the bird and the running water and the living bird with the cedar wood, the hyssop, and the scarlet, Then he shall let the living bird loose outside the city in the open field and make atonement for the house, and it shall be clean. So the same way you atone personally, the same way that the leprosy is cleansed by the priest, is done the same way as it is for a home or a house, a dwelling place. It's the same. The same practice the priest carries out the same way. And he ends here by saying, verse 54, This is the law for any leprous sore and skull, for the leprosy of a garment and of a house, for a swelling and a scab and a bright spot, to teach when it is unclean and when it is clean. This is the law of leprosy. And so the leprosy can literally... infest and tear something apart. In this case, a home, a structure. Whether it be our actual home, family, even our hearts. If there's some sort of uncleanness. And like I said before, even in the churches. And unfortunately, All of the churches in this country are not on the same page. Sad to say. 
In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, it says, You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And that's the only way that we can go before the Lord and be presented before the Lord is through Jesus Christ and to be cleansed of the sin of leprosy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for um, the very specific, vivid picture you present, Lord, and showing how you cleanse, how you take great care, and how you provide for those who are poor in spirit, Lord, to come before you, Lord, to be presented as clean before the Lord. We thank you, Lord, for allowing us to see, Lord, to have this window open for us, for us to see the provision, Lord, that you have so carefully laid out for us, Lord. Um, Lord, just to show us the care, um, the love that you have for us, Lord, knowing that we fall short, Lord, that you provide a way for us to be made clean. So we thank you, Lord. We praise you, and we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.